<coughs> Today's hearing will focus on oversight of the U.S. Department of Transportation's implementation of the Moving Ahead for Progress in the 21st Century Act, better known as MAP 21, and the President's uh, Budget Year 2015 request. MAP 21 was signed into law by the President on July 6, 2012, and authorizes the Federal Highway Transit and Highway Safety Programs through September 30, 2014. It's pleased to hear the Department intends to send a reauthorization proposal to Congress sometime in the near future. Reauthorizing these programs is a priority for the committee, and we look forward to reviewing the Department's proposals. MAP 21 consolidated uh, many federal programs that were duplicative or were not in the federal uh, interest. These uh, changes provide greater focus on the core national systems and give our non-federal partners greater flexibility to meet their transportation needs. MAP 21 made major reforms and improvements to the project delivery process. It currently could take almost 14 years for a transportation project to be completed if federal funding is involved, which is clearly unacceptable. Some of the MAP 21 reforms include allowing federal agencies to review projects concurrently, penalties for agencies that don't meet project review deadlines, and expanding categorical exclusions for projects in the existing right-of-way or with limited federal investment. These reforms will help cut bureaucratic red tape and quickly deliver the economic and safety benefits of transportation projects. The Department has started implementing these project delivery provisions, and I look forward to discussing their pro progress. MAP 21 also increases transparency and accountability by requiring states and transit agencies in conjunction with metropolitan planning organizations to incorporate performance targets into their long-term transportation plans. These performance targets will help our non-federal partners focus their limited federal resources on projects that have the greatest benefit. MAP 21 also creates a program to provide relief for public transportation systems that were affected by a natural disaster or catastrophic failure. Previously, transit agency had, agencies had to work through FEMA to replace equipment or rebuild their systems after a disaster. But after Katrina, Transit agencies sought an emergency program similar to the emergency relief program operated by the Federal Highway Administration. This program was utilized by the states and communities impacted by Hurricane Sandy. Numerous trucking safety provisions were included in MAP 21, which reflects Congress's commitment to keeping truckers and the traveling safe, public safe. Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration is tasked with implementing new regulations on electronic logging devices, hazardous material safety permits, a drug and alcohol clearinghouse for commercial drivers, and a motor carrier registration uh, uh, requirements related to unsafe uh, uh, reincarnated uh, carriers. These regulations will keep drivers safe while maximizing the efficiency of the trucking industry. Congress also recognized that new highway safety challenges have emerged. National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is required to implement a national priority safety program that incentivizes states to pass and enforce laws that address important safety issues. The program focuses on impaired driving countermeasures, occupant protection, motorcycle safety, distracted driving, and graduated driver's licensing. These reforms are only part of the sweeping changes made in MAP 21. Look forward to hearing from the Department on the progress it's made implementing the reforms that I've highlighted and others that were included in MAP 21. March 5th, the President released his budget year 2015 request for the Department. The request also included the Administration's vision for a four-year, $302 billion surface transportation reauthorization bill. Look forward to discussing the details of the budget request. And now I recognize our ranking member, Eleanor Holmes Norton, for any opening statement she may wish to make. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for this uh, and, and the continuing series of very important hearings that the committee and the subcommittee have been holding on uh, MAP, 20, MAP 21. And I look forward to hearing from the witnesses on the progress they're making on regulations under MAP 21 
and whatever information they can provide us on the President's uh, own proposal. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, the changes that we enacted in MAP 21 are proving what I think we all recognized, and that is uh, many <laughs> years to put in place uh, to bring about the reforms, the rather considerable reforms envisioned there. That was a policy-heavy uh, um, authorization. Uh, in contrast to two years of flat funding in MAP 21, uh, we provided uh, uh, an administration with many years' work of work on regulation. So we haven't begun yet to understand the implications, indeed to even see uh, many of the regulations. And I think that's to be expected given how substantial were the, uh, subst uh, the policy changes in MAP 21. Mr. Chairman, I am I'm summarizing my testimony and ask that my full testimony, my full opening statement rather, be put in the record. Uh, gone are the days, uh, I believe, when we can have three months extensions or even two year bills. Secretary Fox has uh, been clear, warning is out there. Uh, that do we run out of money even for this flat two-year bill in August, and he will begin rationing for what funds are left uh, for the states uh, sometime in this summer. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that spells out C-R-I-S-I-S. -I, -S. I don't see how it could be more clear, not even enough money <laughs> to last throughout this authorization period. If we do not address this crisis now, and that is why this hearing is so important and why I'm so grateful for this hearing, if we do not begin right, right now to focus on what is, what is a genuinely difficult problem, in FY 2015, DOT will shut its doors to any new projects and states will not be able to obligate any new federal surface transportation program funds. I wonder if that's ever happened in, in the history of the United States before. I, I hope it does not happen again. I do not think it's an exaggeration to say that were we to act there that irresponsibly, the impact on highway and transit capital programs and transit operations across the country would be an unmitigated disaster. Um, our challenges, uh, these challenges make it imperative that we begin working on addressing the trust fund shortfall and really developing a new uh, template uh, for the trust fund now. Um, I'm very encouraged that the administration has included an outline of a surface transportation proposal in its FY, for its FY 2015 budget. I look forward to um, seeing the details of that proposal when it's, being, when it's been submitted in full to Congress. Uh, and I uh, am encouraged because there are ideas that have been forthcoming in both Democratic and Republican proposals in the President's own outline, and I'm hopeful that we will use uh, his proposal as a guidepost as we seek a way uh, to find funding for an authorization which I trust will be at least six years. Mr. Chairman, I thank you again for this important hearing, and above all, I, I'm grateful to today's witnesses. Thank you. Today's panel consists of the Honorable Peter M. Rogoff, Acting under Secretary for Policy, the Office of the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Transportation, Mr. Greg Natto, uh, Deputy Administrator of the Federal Highway Administration, uh, Therese McMillan, Deputy Administrator of the Federal Transit Administration, the Honorable Ann S. Farrell, Administrator of the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, and the Honorable David Friedman, Acting Administrator of the National Highway Traffic uh, Safety Administration. Welcome to all of you. Your full statements. Uh, uh, with unanimous consent will be made a part of the record without objection. 
and uh, we invite you to uh, summarize them in approximately 15 minutes, beginning with uh, Mr. Rogoff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Norton, members of the subcommittee. Thanks for inviting me here today to report on our progress in carrying out the MAP 21 law and to discuss our 2015 budget. I'm joined here this morning by the modal administrators who will testify principally about MAP 21 implementation. I will testify principally about the administration's budget and our comprehensive reauthorization plan. Since the beginning of the Obama administration, the U.S. DOT has worked extensively to rebuild our nation's infrastructure, put Americans back to work, and improve efficiency in our processes. Given the, deter the, the deteriorating condition of our nation's roadways, railways, and transit systems, continued robust federal investment is essential. And our underlying programs supporting our investments require an overhaul. The Highway Trust Fund will face insolvency by as soon as this summer. Secretary Fox and the entire U.S. DOT team have been sounding the alarm on this concern for some months now. The highway account of the trust fund is likely to dip below the critical $4 billion funding level as soon as July, and the transit account will fall below $1 billion sometime in August. Absent action by Congress to replenish the trust fund, U.S. DOT will be required to implement cash management measures to preserve a positive balance in the trust fund and head off insolvency. If the trust fund were to become insolvent, hundreds of thousands of jobs across the nation could be at risk and our ability to address the many road, rail, and transit needs in every state will be severely impeded. We look forward to partnering with you to avoid a catastrophic impact to transportation construction activity in the middle of this summer's construction season. When it comes to our investment policies, MAP 21 started us in the right direction. It repositioned programs and it reformed critical aspects of the way our infrastructure is built, the way roads and bridges are maintained, and the way projects are delivered. We believe, however, that more needs to be done. Going forward, the administration will be proposing further reforms through a $302 billion four-year transportation reauthorization plan that provides substantially increased and stable funding for our nation's highways, bridges, transit, and rail systems. The administration's plan is fully paid for through existing revenue and $150 billion in transition revenue from pro-growth business tax reform. Mr. Chairman, you stated in your opening statement that the record of uh, the duration that projects take from beginning to end is unacceptable, and the administration agrees. Uh, our reauthorization plan will deliver major projects more efficiently by advancing policies to facilitate the President's stated goal of reducing the permitting and approval time for major infrastructure projects in half, all while creating incentives for better outcomes for communities and the environment. Our plan will increase capacity to move people and freight, which is absolutely critical when you consider that by the year 2050, our country will experience an increase of over 100 million residents. This effort includes a new $10 billion initiative over four years dedicated solely to improving critical freight connections. The program will encourage improved state and regional planning around critical freight corridors. It will also give shippers and truck and rail industry representatives a meaningful role in crafting investment decisions in partnership with state and local governments. The plan will also ensure that we focus on fixing it first, improving the safety and performance of our existing infrastructure. This effort includes a new program aimed at repairing structurally deficient interstate highway system bridges, improving safety on rural roads, and supporting a state of good repair on the national highway system. Our plan will also better connect Americans in both urban and rural communities by investing in transportation projects that better serve centers of employment, education, and essential services. Uh, this effort includes more than $2 billion over four years for a new rapid growth area transit program that will link people to jobs and educational opportunities in fast-growing areas across the country. And the plan will create more resilient communities by promoting smarter transportation planning to reduce fuel use, conserve energy, and build for the challenges of the future. In the coming weeks, the administration will formally transmit a legislative proposal to Congress to provide the programmatic details behind each one of these plans. And when the bill is transmitted, Mr. Chairman, we sincerely hope that the committee will invite the department back to discuss them in full. We look forward to working closely with this subcommittee as we build on the reforms contained in MAP 21 to bring infrastructure improvements to Americans in a faster, better, and smarter way. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I look forward to answering your questions when all the testimony is complete. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Netto.
My apologies. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Norton, members of the subcommittee, uh, for the invitation to appear before you today uh, to discuss the President's fiscal year 2015 budget request and Federal Highway Administration's continued progress in implementing MAP 21. MAP 21 made changes aimed at improving safety, rebuilding highways and bridges, expanding TIFIA credit assistance for major infrastructure projects, focusing on freight policy, accelerated project delivery, and moving toward a more performance based driven system. Uh, building on the reforms in MAP 21, President Obama recently uh, proposed a budget for the next fiscal year and laid out his vision for a four-year translation, uh, service translation authorization that will strengthen these and other priorities even further. MAP 21's infusion of performance-based planning and programming into state and MPO investment decision-making will go a long way to help preserve and improve our surface transportation assets. We should seek to build on these efforts in the next authorization. I am pleased to report that yesterday Federal Highway published the first of our rulemaking seeking public comment on the safety-related performance measures. The President's plan will also allow us to build on the successes in MAP 21 and accelerating project delivery by implementing new policies and procedures that will move USDOT and our federal partners toward fulfilling the President's stated goal of reducing the permitting and approval time for major infrastructure projects by half. This has long been a priority area for Federal Highway, and we will continue to pursue our Everyday Counts, or EDC as we know it, initiatives to demonstrate real savings of time and cost around uh, the country, resulting directly from the deployment of technological and procedural innovation. Importantly, EDC is a partnership with state and local transportation agencies and the private sector, important because they deliver the projects. Many of our successes in shortening project delivery and increased awareness of the innovations proposed, uh, promoted under EDC are recognized throughout MAP 21. For example, Congress authorized the use on federally funded highway projects uh, for the once experimental construction manager general contractor project delivery method that's been promoted under EDC. Other examples are included in my written testimony. Moving beyond MAP 21, we believe that the next authorization must be comprehensive and should continue the focus on safety, freight, streamline project delivery, and enhance performance management while increasing our investment in multimodal freight projects and doing more to connect communities to centers of employment, education, and service. The President's 2015 budget proposes a four-year authorization and requests $48.6 billion for Federal Highway in FY 2015 to maintain and improve the safety, condition, and performance of our national highway infrastructure and enable Federal Highway to provide effective stewardship and oversight of highway programs and funding. The President's budget not only fills the looming shortfall on the highway account of the Highway Trust Fund for the next four years, it provides a sizable growth in highway investment and a boost of almost 20 percent to help us address the many critical needs we have across the national highway network. Thank you again for the invitation to appear before you today, and I look forward to continued work with you and your staff as we build on the reforms in MAP 21 and move toward a new surface transportation authorization. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. McMill. Chairman Petri and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to discuss the Federal Transit Administration's progress implementing MAP 21 and the administration's priorities for next year's budget and the upcoming reauthorization. MAP 21 codifies some of President Obama's highest priorities for strengthening the nation's public transportation systems at a time when transit ridership is at its highest level since 1956, with almost 10.7 billion trips taken in 2013, according to APTA's latest figures. I'm proud of the progress we've made on the issues that are important to our riders and to us, particularly given the challenge of the law's two-year time frame in addressing its provisions. For example, at a time when our nation faces a serious $86 billion transportation infrastructure deficit for transit, MAP 21 creates a more needs-based state of good repair formula program for fixing fixed guideways. We're in the process of establishing a national transit asset management system to ensure that all of our grantees adopt, adopt a strategic and individual approach for managing their capital. And we'll hold them accountable for leveraging all available resources to bring their systems into a state of good repair. 
We are reviewing comments on our landmark advance notice of a proposed rulemaking issued last fall, emphasizing the need for asset management and safety to go hand in hand. We're also working closely with state safety oversight agencies to help them get on course to put a stronger and more consistent safety oversight regime in place. I assure you we remain sensitive to concerns about how we implement our new authority in the safety arena. This is not a one-size-fits-all approach. We've also made strides under MAP21 to help our grant programs work better and make better use of taxpayer dollars, issuing new regulations and guidance to accelerate project delivery, streamline the NEPA process, and help our communities build the transit systems they need more quickly and efficiently. MAP21 has set us on a right path, but there is much more to be done. As President Obama said recently in today's global economy, First-class jobs gravitate to first-class infrastructure. That is why the President is seeking a 63% increase in FTA's budget for next year over this year's enacted level. That would provide us an additional $6.8 billion to strengthen transit safety oversight, build our nation's bus and rail transit infrastructure into a state of good repair, and provide new and expanded transit systems in many communities. Our request includes $2.5 billion to support construction of major capital rail and bus projects around the nation and bring relief to existing transit corridor, corridors that are at or near capacity. These projects create thousands of good jobs and give communities the transportation choices to access jobs, education, health care, and other, other vital services. I would also highlight we're seeking nearly $14 billion in formula funds to help our grantees get the job right, including $5.1 billion uh, in increases above our current funding level to support strategic fix-it-first investments, bringing our nation's rail transit infrastructure into a state of good repair, and replacing aging buses that have literally logged in millions of miles. We also recognize how important transit has become in rural communities and on our tribal lands, uh, where there are now more than 1,400 operators providing more than 140 million trips annually. We are seeking over $600 million to support that uh, demand in communities. Finally, I would note we are seeking $60 million for research and training activities, including uh, significant funds to support workers to find jobs in, tra in the transportation sector. All of this is an integral part of the President's robust four-year, $302 billion reauthorization package, and that will support the nation's surface transportation systems, including public transit. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my testimony, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Administrator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Chairman Petri, Ranking Member Norton, and members of the subcommittee. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, explain FMCSAs, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration's implementation of MAP 21 uh, requirements, as well as some highlights on our FY15 budget. DOT's top priority is safety, and for FMCSA, it was very exciting to see MAP 21 support the safety framework in which FMCSA has been driving forward to make safety gains in further reducing crashes involving commercial motor vehicles on our highways. That framework that really is uh, outlined very well in MAP 21 consists of raising the bar to safety to come into this industry, ensuring once you're operating in the industry that you're maintaining high safety standards to stay there, and using all the tools at our disposal to get the high-risk companies and drivers and service providers off the road to either get better um, or get out of the business. And so when it comes to MAP21, MAP21 really advanced some key priorities in that regard. To date, we have already uh, implemented more than half of the new rulemaking requirements that MAP21 incorporated, which number almost up to 40. Um, and cutting right to the chase, right out of the box, we implemented new rules that put in place some exemptions for certain types of agricultural operators and agricultural vehicles, um, exemptions from some of the core safety requirements, and we put in place uh, new mandates on financial security for brokers and freight forwarders. I'm very excited to say that a month ago we uh, issued and published a notice of proposed rulemaking for the first ever drug and alcohol clearinghouse. And just yesterday I got the word from OMB that they have completed their review of a high priority rule known as electronic logging devices and we will be publishing that supplemental notice of proposed rulemaking uh, in no time, uh, imminently. 
MAP-21 also included some new enforcement authorities to help us with our crackdown on high-risk motor coach companies. We have been very aggressive in, concer in, in concerning motor coach companies and incorporated n those new tools and enhanced training that we have already deployed across at least half of our investigators as of this date and will complete training before the end of this year as they proceed to focus on the highest risk bus and truck companies. And then lastly on MAP-21, um, we have underway uh, both uh, listening sessions um, as well as building the framework for rules that will require testing prior to getting the authority for any new applicant for interstate op operating authority, any new applicant as in a company, a bus, truck, motor coach, household goods, hazmat. And so that new entrant testing, part of MAP-21, we've held several listening sessions on. We have a few more to go, and that'll help us set the framework for the rule. And we're actively working on strategies to move forward with a rulemaking on entry-level driver training for commercial drivers. With regard to the President's FY15 budget request of $669 million for FMCSA, um, not quite half, uh, about $315 million will support FMCSA's safety enforcement work and allow us to implement some of the other operating requirements of MAP21 that accelerates our review of new entrants into the industry. Um, it, the other half, a little more than half, will go to states in the form of grants again, to further enhance uh, motor carrier safety enforcement through roadside inspections. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my remarks, and thank you again for the opportunity to talk about those key initiatives. Thank, thank you. Uh, Mr. Friedman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Norton and all the members of the subcommittee. I truly appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today. And I'd also like to thank each and every one of you on this committee for your efforts on MAP21. I look forward to working with you to strengthen highway safety through a comprehensive four-year reauthorization of our surface transportation programs as the President has proposed. Now NHTSA takes tremendous pride in our nearly five decade long record of protecting Americans by partnering with the states and to enforce strong highway safety laws and by working to make vehicles safer. Since 1970, highway fatalities have declined by 36 percent, and they've fallen by 22 percent in just the last decade. But we also have to face the reality of where the numbers are today. There are more than 30,000 fatalities on America's roadways each year. We must continue to look for at new and innovative ways to save lives while continuing to support education and enforcement efforts that we know deliver results. The administration does continue, as Administrator Farrow noted, to place safety at the forefront of all that the department does. And the President's budget request continues our efforts to save lives, reduce injuries, and lower the costs of crashes. States are a vital partner in these efforts. And that's why, as part of the budget, we are requesting $577 million for highway traffic safety grants. Implementing MAP-21 has been a major priority for NHTSA. The agency issued an interim final rule to expedite guidance to the states as quickly as possible. We want to get the money out and get it doing the good work that it's intended to do as fast as possible. So we continue to work with states to help them access those resources under MAP-21 and to put them to good use. Now I'd like to briefly discuss a few of our priorities as they are related to MAP-21. First of all, seatbelts. Seatbelts remain one of the single most effective ways to re reduce deaths and injuries. And seatbelt usage is on the rise in our nation, and that is great news. But I do need to emphasize that seatbelt use continues to be higher in states with primary belt laws. We are also working to address the issue of the epidemic of drunk driving, where more than 10,000 Americans lose their lives in a completely avoidable crashes. We must make more progress on this critical issue. NHTSA is also very concerned about the upward trends in pedestrian and bicyclist fatalities. As Americans spend more and more time walking and cycling, we must bring new resources and proven strategies to bear to better protect them. We are working with the states, for example, to develop new performance metrics on bicycles so that we can be targeting the resources where they need to go to affect and improve the issue of bicycle fatalities. Bicycle and pedestrian uh, fatalities are a 
priority of Secretary Fox, so you can expect to see our efforts in these areas continue to grow. Now, we've also worked very hard to help older Americans maintain their mobility safely. Older drivers are safer drivers on average, but they are more likely to suffer serious injuries if involved in a crash. And so it's important that we continue to look for ways to mitigate those risks. Now, in addition to NHTSA's traditional enforcement efforts, we're also looking to vehicle technologies for ways to save lives. The President's budget request supports NHTSA's plan to expand the agency's focus on technology. Advanced safety technologies such as vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications and automated vehicles can help drivers avoid crashes in the first place. Advances in technology are also providing new comforts and amenities for drivers and passengers. Our goal at NHTSA is for drivers and passengers to usher in and be able to access new technologies while filtering out new distractions. We will continue those efforts to work with the industry and to work um, to minimize these distractions. Now, in all of our work, President Obama and Secretary Fox have emphasized the need to be efficient with limited budgetary resources. To that end, NHTSA has strengthened its budgetary oversight to ensure that taxpayer resources are effectively managed and appropriately invested to save lives. Now, to conclude, and frankly, with uh, apologies to my DOT colleagues, I want to close by noting that I don't think that you will ever find a workforce more passionately invested in its mission to save lives than you will find at NHTSA. NHTSA's commitment to protecting the American people never wavers. Thank you again, members of the committee, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you all for your summaries of your, uh, and your complete statements will be made a part of the record. Uh, I, I have a couple of questions. Mr. Friedman, one thing that's worth mentioning uh, is that obviously safety is number one and we want to be vigilant and keep making improvement, but there has been quite a, a uh, success story there in the sense that the number of fatalities on the nation's highways has been tending downward for a number of years now, and it used to be in the 40 to 50,000 range, and it's now in the 30 to uh, 20,000 range. And I think the percentage of accidents that are due to human mistakes or picadillos of one sort or another, as opposed to mechanical failures, has been uh, 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 there's been a significant improvement in the by the auto industry and trucking industry in trying to build more safety uh, into vehicles and to Give, give people more uh, uh, more of a margin for error, and that's continuing with the autonomous vehicle technology that's rolling out and the like. And it's uh, we're we're in government doing something, but in the private sector, they're actually doing quite a lot uh, that's been very effective as as well. And it's worth worth acknowledging that it is saving lives, and and uh, we should focus on success as well as failures, I think, is that, that uh, people like, like to know that they're getting somewhere and not just being frustrated. But my question is that uh, NHTSA funded the National Roadside Survey of Alcohol and Drug Drivers in 2013, and we've been hearing from citizens who encountered this survey while driving and who believe they were pulled over by law enforcement subjected to breath, saliva, and blood samples. And uh, since the survey hires law enforcement officers uh, to direct traffic, and I guess they're, they are often in their uh, uh, uniforms, uh, it could appear to a motorist that, they were, motorist that they were entering into a DUI checkpoint or some sort of involuntary uh, government uh, search regime. And I'm certainly supportive of research on drunk and drug driving but I'm concerned that motorists who encounter these surveys are not properly informed that the survey is voluntary. Uh, and uh, we're increasingly living in a society where people are worrying about Big Brother and government overstepping its bounds in a number of different areas, and I think we need to be sensitive to that. So my question is, how is NHTSA addressing these concerns, and what procedures does NHTSA require in order to inform the motorists that the survey is voluntary? 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And quickly, relative to your first point, we look at uh, improving safety as a partnership. It's a partnership with the states, it's a partnership with Congress, and it's a partnership with industry. We need everyone moving forward, and we've made tremendous progress in reducing highway fatalities. Our goal is to make a lot more. Uh, in regards to the, to the roadside survey, it's definitely gotten a, a lot of attention. This is a very important program. It is a voluntary program. When drivers approach these sites, the very first thing that they see is a very large orange sign with the words, paid voluntary survey. That is their very first indication that this is a voluntary survey. Um, in many cases, they can be waived into the survey site by police officers. Those police officers are there because our priority is safety. The job of those police officers is to ensure the safety of the participants, to ensure the safety of the researchers, because while we're gathering this data, we need to make sure that everyone is safe. And when the driver enters the site, they are told very clearly in a very strict protocol by the researchers that this is voluntary. They are given the opportunity to drive away. In fact, when drivers first see this orange sign, about a quarter of them drive through. It's also important to note, this is a voluntary survey that collects anonymous data purely targeted at alcohol and drug use among drivers. I believe we've taken every effort to make sure that that is clear. In fact, we're taking additional efforts, for example, uh, removing the initial use of, a, uh, of an air sampler to test uh, the level of alcohol on people's breath to ensure that we get their consent first before gathering any data. Well, the next time you, you do one of these, or next couple of times, I don't know if, if you or someone in your department could quietly and anonymously just drive down the road and see if all these procedures work and go through the experience without letting them, not an official inspection, but because sometimes you put things on paper, but in reality, it, people follow the path of least resistance, and it's, you know, uh, the public is clearly, we're hearing from them, they're concerned about this. And, and I understand those concerns, and, and we've continued to take those concerns very seriously. Um, and uh, we have sent staff out to these sites, and we regularly audit to make sure that all these policies and procedures are moving forward. We make sure to get the cooperation of the states as we move forward, as well as local law enforcement to ensure that everyone is informed and safety is protected in these voluntary and anonymous surveys. Thank you. Yeah, I have one other quick question, uh, Ms. Farrell. Several of my constituents have expressed their frustration with uh, uh, Federal Motor uh, Carrier Safety Administration's safety measurement system. Roadside, roadside inspection violation data was erroneously issued by an enforcement officer, it was later challenged in court, and the violation was dismissed. My constituents submitted an appeal of the dismissed violation uh, through the data uh, queue system, but the off, uh, officer that issued the violation declined to repeal the violation for the uh, SMS. These scores are having real-world impacts on a carrier's ability to find business and erroneous violations could put a carrier out of business. So if it's not a valid administration a, a violation, it, why is it not being removed and how, how, how is this issue being addressed? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, at the heart of that issue uh, uh, has been a question about fairness. And so we have examined, we've, we've spoken with a lot of companies and drivers about the issue. We have heard a lot of recommendations. And so uh, late last year, we put together and issued, published a notice for comment on a new approach to that very issue. And that new approach would establish in the case where a state charge is issued at the same time as a federal violation on a safety issue in a roadside inspection, if that state charge is dismissed, the violation points would also be removed from that SMS system. If the violation, if the state charge is downgraded, we would make sure the record is noted uh, that that charge has been downgraded. And so um, we are wrapping up. We received a lot of comments. It closed in uh, January. We're wrapping that up, and we expect to proceed, um, we think, with a, a, a better approach that actually um, will likely address the concern that you raised. Mr. DeFazio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to uh, Mr. Rogoff, you mentioned your testimony, uh, four billion funding level as soon as July fall, uh, for uh, highway and one for August, and then you talk about 
uh, implementing uh, procedures uh, to preserve uh, solvency. Uh, how soon do you think uh, will you start uh, adjusting downward, paring back, delaying? I'm not sure how you're going to do it. Uh, reimbursements to states and local agencies, and what form do you think it'll take? Well, um, Mr. DeFazio, I cited those specific thresholds: four billion uh, for right. the highway account and one billion as the transit account is sort of when our first alarm goes off. So you're going to go up to that point? We will, but you know, we, we know what, when it's coming with increasing certainty with each passing month as we see the Treasury reports of, of, of receipts uh, versus expenditures. I think importantly, uh, with the re-estimate uh, that comes with the submission of the budget, frankly, the, the trajectory for the highway account is actually worsened, um, and uh, which has us very concerned about this coming summer. The procedures that we use uh, are effectively delaying reimbursement. Uh, both of these programs work on a reimbursable basis, uh, and we normally reimburse a grantee uh, anywhere from within a matter of hours to generally no more than a day and a half. Uh, that allows them to not have to float cash, if you will, to the sure. federal government. So what are we uh, looking at? And so it certainly, by, my, our biggest concern is uh, absent action to rectify this problem, the states and the transit agencies are going to are going to start revisiting their in, uh, investment decisions a lot right. sooner than that. Um, so uh, while we will, you know, start implementing cash management procedures as we trickle down below four billion and below a billion, um, we are concerned that we will see a slowdown before that that will impact employment. Right. I believe uh, Kansas has already announced uh, at least one state. I've got a letter from Oregon Department of Transportation. They're looking more at the next fiscal year, but I would assume that many states will follow and we could see a slowdown. Um, the, um, I, I, I'm just curious that the administration has put forward a proposal with illusory corporate tax reform, which won't happen this year. We're going to pay for the trust fund. Do you have a backup plan? Because I have personally presented to the president, presented to your predecessor, uh, presented to the current secretary, I mean, I mean, not your predecessor, to uh, uh, Ray LaHood, current secretary, a simple idea. Now, as I drove to work uh, on Friday and I came home, gas had gone up a nickel a gallon. Was I outraged? Did I scream and yell? Did I pound? No, I expect it, okay? Well, what if 1.4 cents of that had gone to rebuild our infrastructure? Simple proposal, index the current user fee gas tax to construction cost inflation, fleet fuel economy. We've run the numbers. Your department ran the numbers. It's about 1.4, 1.7 cents a gallon per year. I don't think anybody is going to get unelected because of that, even though there is a lot of tax aversion around here. And, and use that projected cash flow for bonding to backfill the trust fund. We have an unprecedented problem. We could raise the tax a dime today. You'd still have this cash flow problem because it's the trust fund balance that we're worried about. Uh, I mean, is the administration looking at, will they consider a realistic backup plan like mine, which uh, I believe could work and is, you know, based in history, which is it's a user fee funded program. Mr. DeFazio, the administration has made clear, the president, the secretary on down, that we are uh, open-minded to any alternatives that people want to put on the, the table that helps solve Oh, I know, but I put it on the table now for four years. You first, you know, you killed my reauthorization, not you, but the administration, because they were scared to death of revenues of any sort. Now they've got an illusory fake, you know, I mean, it's great. Yeah, corporate tax reform is going to pay for everything in America. It's not going to happen. Not going to happen. Well, this I, year. I, I'm not going to buy into the notion they're that they're illusory. I mean, we, we right. We, no, we I put I'm, forward I'm, a series fine, of Mr. proposals. Rogoff, that's fine. But my point is, <laughs> this is a real proposal. It's real. It's based in history. It's only 1.4, 1.7 cents a gallon. You know, I can go to the most conservative parts of my district, tell people what I'm going to build with this, who I'm going to put to work, and say, would you, you know, will you support that? And the answer is, people are not going to be outraged, except for a few idiots. Sir, we, we have made <laughs> very clear um, what the Secretary has said repeatedly in the last few weeks in discussions with members is, is that right now we have a proposal, Mr. Camp has a proposal, there are other proposals right. out there, including yours, including uh, okay. other members. Okay, that's good, thank you. Quick question, Ms. Farrow. Um, uh, I just want to know, you were uh, conducting uh, an ongoing uh, study, as I under understand it, of detention time issues and what the impact is on uh, drivers, uh, and et cetera. Where are we at on that? 
me. Um, the agency is continuing uh, with the second phase of the detention study so that we can uh, analyze the final link between detention time and safety outcomes. Okay. Expect those to be done in 2015. I'm very eager to see it done. Detention time is uh, uh, really impactful on drivers, on driver safety, and frankly, uh, wastes almost $4 billion in industry efficiency. So thank you for the question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Crawford. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, after enactment of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act in 2009, the Department of Transportation undertook a major effort to publicize the status and impact of these funds. It's my understanding both the Federal Transit Administration and the Federal Highway Administration included substantial information, including sometimes weekly state-specific reports on their websites to detail for the public the progress in utilizing these funds. There's a provision in MAP 21, Section 1503C, entitled Transparency and Accountability that basically directs the Department of Transportation to do for the core highway and public transportation program investments what it did for the Recovery Act highway and transit funds. We have a lot of people in our country who question the value of federal transportation investment. It seems to me it would be a good idea to a uh, place to start uh, to, in answering this question is showing them how each state benefits from these funds. It also seems that you thought this was a pretty good idea for uh, a strategy for Recovery Act funds. So my question then for uh, Mr. Rogoff and Mr. Anato, is there a substantive reason why the department has not been providing the American people with the specifics of how core highway and transit program funds are used in a timely matter, manner pursuant to this provision of MAP 21 as you did with stimulus funds? Thank you, uh, Congressman. Uh, I, uh, first, I uh, want you to know we've been diligently working uh, uh, on this requirement and expect to post a detailed report on the web uh, and issue the summary report to Congress by late spring. Uh, consistent with similar financial reports uh, and requirements MAP 21, the software development was time to ensure that we have uh, one year of data uh, available for the report. Um, the scale of this particular report, uh, for example, if you look at the uh, report uh, on, uh, on ARA, we're talking about a universe of about 12 or 13,000 projects uh, and files. This is a universe of a, in excess of 100,000 projects and files. So uh, it uh, simply was a larger task, and uh, we're approaching it as aggressively as we possibly can. But that, that is the expectation of time with respect to delivering that product, and our commitment is to make it uh, uh, of high quality so it will be useful to certainly to you and, and Congress and the American people. Mr. Crawford, could I just add to that? Uh, we agree that greater transparency of where the federal aid highway funds are going by project is very useful. I think as members who are voting and authorizing these projects, you should know precisely where the dollars are going project by project. We would like to know ourselves. Secretary Fox, as a former mayor, I could tell you is, was curious as a, as a mayor in North Carolina where all of North Carolina's dollars were going by project and couldn't always get the information he wanted either. Um, we are standing up that capability. You, you drew a distinction between the Recovery Act and our regular program. The Recovery Act had reporting requirements in it, in statute, that gave us all of this additional information. That was not carried over to the federal aid program, and we're not necessarily recommending that it be so because it was really quite an administrative burden on the grantees. But that said, we are working to get project by project data, and we're as interested in it as you are. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate it. And yield back. Thank you, Mr. Series. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing today. You know, I was very pleased to hear that Chairman Schuster is uh, looking forward to addressing the freight mobility as one of his priorities uh, for the bill. And I'm happy to see the administration is also interested in that. I have a concern where. Will the proposal attempt to address the concerns of large projects that are, that are in different states um, that are relatively flush from the formula? Is that going to be addressed because they tend to fare less than the other projects? Well, if I could, um, the uh, administration's proposal for a freight program, and I think this, like a number of other questions, we are going to be somewhat constrained to provide great details until the bill is submitted. But I could tell you that we are specifically looking at multi-state corridor projects and those larger projects 
um, we're using incentive grants to encourage multi-state cooperation because many of these, when you look at these economic centers, especially in your region, they, they cross uh, state lines very quickly. Um, but also to have a, a, a discretionary component so we could provide a sizable enough grant to buy down some of those major game-changing freight projects. Thank you. I want to address the issue of safety. In my district, we are kind of unique. We have these jitney buses, and they are a real headache. I mean, we had last year an accident where one of the jitney buses, the driver was from New York, driving in New Jersey. He lost control of the jitney bus, hit a carriage, killed the baby that was in the carriage, and everybody was outraged, obviously. Uh, do, you know, obviously. I just want to know what more can the federal government do in coordination with the states to make sure that these jitney buses are licensed, that they are inspected, mm -hmm. and that they are meeting the, the, uh, the law. Because this fellow that, that was driving Horrible. basically had nothing. They even think he was texting as he was driving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if you intend to focus more on that because it is a, an increasing problem, especially in urban areas where transit companies are pulling their buses and these jitney buses are coming in and filling in the gap. Uh, Congressman, I, it, 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 thanks to your concern and your focus on this issue, we have had a very good partnership uh, with uh, jurisdictional law enforcement um, in the areas where the Jitneys are operating in New Jersey, up in New York, as well as with our state partners in New Jersey and our division office. And they've uh, had some very effective uh, sting operations and strike forces that have absolutely raised the attention of the Jitney industry. We have followed in with additional investigations. But at the heart of this, and your heart of your question, is what resources can we devote to this issue to really press forward and complete that it's kind of safety outcome we're all driving towards. And the RFY 15 budget uh, does include a request for 77 positions, the vast majority of which are for the field for safety enforcement work relating to our motor coach uh, enforcement efforts. Uh, we have a very focused and targeted motor coach strike force initiative underway that we launched last year um, that has absolutely identified the highest risk motor coach companies and we've taken very aggressive action. But it's something that we put out there as a test to figure out what we needed to really get to one level of safety for all passengers, regardless of which bus they choose to use. And so uh, the gap analysis on that initiative demonstrates the need for additional resources that are incorporated in our 15 budget. But we'll keep pressing forward on our partnership um, that I outlined in the initial part of my response. Are the state of New York and New Jersey cooperating fully with your efforts? Yeah, we've had a very good cooperation, in fact, between New York and New Jersey on our motor coach work, the whole uh, uh, I-95 corridor. So the answer is yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barletta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, specifically, my question relates to uh, triple trailer trucks. Uh, triples can be as long as 110 feet and weigh as much as uh, more than 120,000 pounds. On the other hand, a car is roughly 16 feet long and weighs less than 4,000 pounds, and personally, uh, these triples scare me. And most drivers don't want to share the roads with them. In 2000, uh, a U.S. DOT study found that multi-trailer trucks have an 11 percent higher fatal crash rate than single-trailer trucks. The study said that this finding was significant uh, in terms of the debate about the safety of LCVs. Uh, this study was based on national data. Mr. Rogoff, are you familiar with this finding? I am. Are, are you including it in your study findings? Uh, is, as it relates, if, if you would, if you'd be agreeable, Mr. Barlett, I'm going to let Mr. Nadeau take the question specifically about the, the weight and size study. Uh, thank you, uh, Peter, uh, Ms. Barletta. There, there is uh, uh, a number of configurations included in the study, including triples. Uh, and. Uh, uh, that will be thoroughly examined with respect to impact on infrastructure and impact. So it will be included in the study findings. Uh, will you be updating the findings uh, for the current study? Well, uh, what I'm referring to is the current study, which is uh, 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 by, by direction of MAP 21 due to Congress by uh, November uh, of this year. And uh, that work is presently going on. A number of 
uh, 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 groups that we've assembled are analyzing various elements. Of so we'll be including the, the information from the 2000 study and updating current the, 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 the study is, is, is completely comprehensive uh, and does focus in large part on current literature, uh, historical literature, and, uh, uh, and applied research. So uh, uh, across the board, sir. Good. Thank you. Administrator Farrow, uh, a recent GAO study found significant flaws in CSA, and the program continues to label safe carriers as unsafe within the trucking uh, marketplace. Now, your budget requests millions to fix uh, the system's algorithms. Since your budget priorities seem to suggest that you recognize the problems associated with CSA, why isn't FFM CSA doing the right thing and pulling those scores off the public website until CSA is fixed? Congressman, thank you for that question. The CSA program, Compliance Safety Accountability um, Program, uh, is at the core of our enforcement platform, and it really builds on work we did uh, a decade ago that we used to call SafeStat. Again, used certain inspection and, and uh, investigation data to identify the highest risk companies. CSA really built upon that to utilize our full suite of inspection data, investigation data, to help not just FMCSA prioritize the highest risk companies, and the program does, but also help s companies themselves identify more quickly where they may have a safety issue and address it so that they can continue operating and, 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 and put safety as a key part of their bottom, bottom line. With regard to uh, program uh, critiques, program analysis from GAO, you know, at the heart of GAO's analysis, they identify some areas of improvement that we are committed to do. As I have been from the moment we rolled this program out in 2010, it's got to be a continuous improvement effort. We've got to make full use of our data. And we absolutely owe it to the public to help prevent crashes, not wait for them to occur, and then go ahead and look at the company. The GAO study, one of their core recommendations is to do just what I said. Wait until the crash occurs. And by the way, just look at the larger companies. Now, we have 500,000 companies, the vast majority of which are 10 trucks or fewer. So it is very important that we incorporate all the safety data into our analysis and use that analysis to anticipate a crash, get to that company ahead of time with an intervention, and help them avoid that crash and that fatality. But, but rest assured, we are committed to incorporate uh, improvements that are recommended through the kinds of analysis that you referenced. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hahn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was going to address my question to um, Mr. Nato. So as you, you probably know, Los Angeles puts a lot of uh, our own money into funding transportation projects. Uh, most recently in 2008, voters of uh, L.A. County approved Measure R, which was a half-cent sales tax that will raise $40 billion over the next 30 years for road and transit projects. So we came up with the concept of uh, America Fast Forward. Instead of uh, waiting 30 years using tax revenue to build these projects, we thought it was a smarter idea to have uh, the federal government kind of front load uh, those projects with the guaranteed return of uh, the revenue over 30 years. Part of America Fast Forward was advancing the expansion of TIFIA program, which was successfully adopted into MAP 21. This expansion was seen as having the potential to speed up the construction of a number of large critical programs that weren't approved under the previous TIFIA program, which had smaller lending authority. States and localities all across this country are depending on the favorable term rates of TIFIA to revolutionize the way they finance uh, infrastructure projects. Fortunately, we heard testimony during the subcommittee's last roundtable discussion that mentioned despite the substantial increase in loan authority, DOT's approval of TIFIA loans was still incredibly slow, and the pace of approval for TIFIA projects was no faster than it was before this expansion. So particularly in L.A. County, we're concerned on uh, doing a better job of approving these. Give you a shout-out uh, that... Um, we were informed that uh, DOT, that uh, TIFIA sent a letter to the Gerald Desmond Bridge Replacement Project in Long Beach inviting them to apply for a TIFIA, TIFIA loan, which could provide up to $300 million for the project. But I want to know what you're doing 
uh, to increase the rate at which uh, your office approves these loans. That's what's going to be critical as we move forward to um, invest in our country's infrastructure. Uh, Congresswoman Hahn, if it's okay, I'm going to take that question. Okay. Um, we have always uh, been very impressed and hold out, obviously, Measure R as sort of a national model on how uh, when, the, when the local voters step up and decide to invest in themselves, that the federal government should both applaud and help that and, and magnify that investment. Um, I believe we've actually been rather successful in the following respect in making the TIFIA loans happen for L.A. in a timely manner in that we have been able to, uh, for the first time, get the Federal Transit Administration and the TIFIA program sort of working hand in glove. So when we were ready to sign a full funding grant agreement for the regional connector, the TIFIA loan was ready to go. When we're ready to sign a full funding grant agreement for the West Side Subway, the TIFIA grant is ready to go. Now, I think it's important to remember, we are working, and I know our, our Chief Financial Officer, uh, Sylvia Garcia, is working on this. But it's also important to remember that TIFIA loans are not like pack and play, one size, they're all identical. In fact, every one of them, I, I believe there's probably no two deals that are identical. Uh, each borrower has a different creditworthiness profile. Each loan has to be negotiated separately. Maybe we'll get to a point where we could do these on a, on a kind of more formatted basis. Um, but in order to protect the taxpayer interest, we do need to make sure. Now, we're, we will do well. We are getting, you know, one so you're, of the... So you're saying the, the testimony that we heard uh, last roundtable that uh, the, the approval was still incredibly slow and... Uh, it's really been no faster oh, we, than... We, we share the fresh, you, Yeah, so I guess my question is, the, what are you doing to... Uh, we, we are reviewing so the processes. We are looking at, at the creditworthiness reviews. We are looking at, at um, again, but one of the, one of the challenges we have, um, we want to make things go uh, more quickly also. Uh, we are asking for $4 billion over four years for TIFIA, so we greatly applaud the expansion of the program that began under... Matt so what are you doing to increase We are the specifically rate. looking at the process by which we put each borrower through in terms of the multiple steps and seeing if that can be streamlined. Um, our challenge comes when each borrower wants a slightly different deal because then we need to go and do our due diligence on their payback ability for that deal. Um, now, we, the Secretary was just in New York talking to people interested in public-private partnerships. We are as critically interested as the committee in sort of getting more of that private money to bear on infrastructure projects. Um, but these are complicated transactions. I cannot tell you that we can execute them as rapidly as we do a grant. Well, it's, it's critical, obviously. It's critical for, and, and not just uh, L.A. County region, but certainly across this country. Folks are really depending on uh, this loan process to speed up the investment in infrastructure. And we know that's what's going to keep our transportation system viable, create jobs, improve the economy. It, really, a lot depends it, on that. Indeed. And when you look, at, when you look uh, across our, our budget proposals, we obviously want to make this a more robust element. Not only are we making a $4 billion commitment to TIFI over four years, the President's budget also has the, the reinstitution of America Fast Forward bonds and the institution of an infrastructure bank that actually expands beyond transportation but goes to other areas of investment, be it school infrastructure investment, power grid, other areas that we, we want. So w we are on board. I'm just trying to explain that we can't turn on a dime and suddenly do a transaction in two weeks that used to take two months. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Rogoff, uh, I'll, I'll keep you going. Hey, uh, in Section 192 of the 2014 Omnibus, uh, Congress made available $80 million in unused safety lieu maglev dollars to fund several dormant rail grant programs, including passenger rail capital projects, railroad safety technology grants that can be used for, for PTC implementation, and high-speed rail corridor planning grants. Of the $80 million, as you know, $20 million is set aside for the high-speed rail corridor planning grants, recognizing that the omnibus gives significant discretion to your, de to your department. Can you shed some light on how the department specifically intends to allocate the remaining $60 million? It, it's currently under review, Mr. Davis. I, I would, you know, be happy. I, I think what would make more sense, if you'd like, is I, I could come up to your office with our FRA administrator, Joe Zabo, and talk through that. Um, because I have been a, a part of some of those discussions, but not all of them. 
and I know uh, a hard decision has not yet been made. Okay. I, anytime I can get a chance to meet with my colleague from Illinois, yeah, Mr. Zabo, and right. you, uh, I will have my office give your office call. Absolutely. And I would like to do that sooner Happy rather than later. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McMillan, you, you mentioned in your testimony that last year was a very challenging year for the capital investment grant program because of sequestration but that 2014 offers a brighter future. Can you tell me what guidance or rules that the FTA has and plans to issue moving forward to carry out the changes made in MAP 21 to improve the project's approval process? Uh, thank you very much, Congressman, for that answer. I think this is an area where the Federal Transit Administration has made some great strides. Um, even prior to MAP 21, we had um, uh, developed a uh, new criteria that was far more responsive to uh, communities for the purposes of evaluating projects, um, including a far more understandable uh, cost effectiveness measure and uh, new uh, criteria on environmental um, benefits and, and the like. We've also been working uh, very closely to continue our streamlining efforts uh, including the notion of a warrant where a uh, agency that it, that either has a small amount of funding as part of federal funding in the larger package or has demonstrated experience in the past can cut through and get through our evaluation process more quickly. Uh, MAP 21, as you know, also um, reduced the number of steps that are required to be followed through, and we're working very closely on uh, rulemaking to uh, put that into uh, uh, regulation and guidance for our, our um, uh, various grantees. Uh, this is a very popular program, and this has been one of our top priorities. I would also say that one of the um, elements that has made the progress, some, uh, the process a bit arduous in the process, is the necessity to do travel modeling, for example, to, to estimate ridership of these future um, uh, uh, projects, and we're proud to say that we've developed an off-the-shelf uh, uh, transit forecasting tool that, if you meet certain um, uh, assumptions and conditions, can, sh can really reduce what used to be a two-year process for estimating uh, transit trips maybe down to two months if you can use this off-the-shelf tool. And that's been working hand-in-hand -hand with our industry to bring that uh, uh, tool to bear. So that's some examples of what we're doing to get this process moving. Thank you, Ms. McMillan. And uh, Mr. Nadeau, uh, following up on what my colleague Ms. Hahn mentioned on the TIFIA program, I want to give you a chance, since you mentioned in your testimony that uh, DOT's closed on eight projects uh, through TIFIA. Uh, I want to know, uh, because I'm a true believer in, in public money to leverage private money and encourage some public-private partnerships, and we both know MAP 21 made some changes to improve participation in rural areas. What kind of response have you seen, and do you think there are ways to build upon these changes and, and increase rural participation? It's, um, uh, I think for projects, uh, and, and rural doesn't necessarily always mean smaller scale. Um, I think the administration... I know, look at my district. Exactly. Uh, I, I, but it, 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 it depends entirely on the economics uh, of the revenue side. If you're generally looking at debt financing as a solution, uh, then obviously revenue becomes the key. So that uh, either uh, 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 relies on a revenue stream coming from uh, state or local revenue sources uh, or, for example, tolling uh, uh, where that is economically viable. I think the administration's view is uh, to develop tools that are flexible uh, and creative and that, uh, above all, leverage uh, uh, capital uh, from private markets. Uh, that theory works both in an urban setting uh, and a rural setting, but it depends entirely on the, the circumstances surrounding the individual project, as Mr. Rogoff pointed off. Yeah, did uh, you have Mr. a comment? Davis, I'm sorry, you're, I just want to point your state has actually stepped out. I mean, in that, at least in the case of, uh, it's a project that's before us and under consideration, but in the case of the Ileana Parkway, for example, mm -hmm. um, the challenge is who's going to pay back the debt, and in that particular case, recognizing that the resources might not be local to pay back the debt, the state, the state is committing themselves to repayment, and that's what facilitates the rural project. So we're, we're working on it. Great. Thank you all very much. I yield back. Ms. Edwards. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you for the hearing today and to our witnesses. Um, I want to first uh, thank the um, President and the Administration for making sure that in its New Starts um, budget proposals, it includes uh, funding for the long sought after Purple Line here in the National uh, Capital Region and the Red Line in, in, in Baltimore. And so I hope that we're able to come through uh, with the resources needed to get those underway because I think it would do a lot uh, to improve things like air and water quality here in the, uh, the metropolitan region and to free up uh, transit along the Beltway so that we can free up that 95 corridor so that uh, farmers can get their goods to market and other sorts of things. Um, I, I've been long concerned about rail uh, safety. When I first came into Congress was just after, um, just before rather, we had that tragic accident on the uh, red line. And so I think a lot has been done by the administration and by WMATA um, and our states to make sure that um, that kind of tragedy doesn't happen in the future, adding, you know, uh, better um, cars on the, on the line, uh, Mr. Rogoff, you know that. Um, but also, um, Senator Mikulski and I, along with our bipartisan delegation here in the metropolitan region, work to make sure that we begin to get some national metro safety standards in place because this accident didn't stand alone. It had been a whole history across the country of similar accidents and finding out that despite recommendations for years, we didn't have really national standards. Now the question becomes how do you implement uh, those standards? And I know that um, um, Deputy Administrator McMillan, um, that uh, the, your administration has been in the, in the process of implementing those standards. You've released some, uh, some grants for, I think, fiscal years 2013 and 2014 um, for state, state safety oversight. But I'm curious to know whether there were existing um, state, sta uh, state, I cannot say that, state safety um, oversight grants that did not meet the criteria that was set forth in MAP 21 and how many of these formula grants went out versus ones that were not. And then lastly, um, what is the FTA doing to bring these oversight agencies into compliance? Thank you very much for the question, Congresswoman. And uh, indeed, as we've said and can't say enough, safety remains the top priority for the DOT overall, and the establishment of safety authority for FTA under MAP 21 was a much appreciated and forward-looking acknowledgement of that priority, and becomes it, it remains one of the major focus areas for implementation for us. With regards to the state safety, safety oversight agencies, um, again, as, as a, a maybe launching off point, these are the agencies that actually existed in law prior, what MAP 21 has done is to clarify and strengthen what their responsibilities are. Uh, the amount of funding that has been available to help them do that, as you noted, has uh, the apportionments have been published for both fiscal year uh, 13, about $21 million, and uh, $22 million in 14. In order to access those funds, they need to be able to either have met the criteria that MAP 21 outlines or be able to put together a plan to show how they are going to get there. So how many of them met, the, of the ones who qualify, how many of them met the criteria? Two of them have met them currently, uh, California and Massachusetts. For the remaining ones, we've been working um, individually with the state safety oversight agencies uh, on a compliance review to say what are, what are the gaps and to help them put together a plan in order to uh, show how they can meet those. But they got the grants anyway? No, when they, they, be, they get the grants at the point they submit a plan and we can see if they've got a path forward. And once that plan is reviewed, then the uh, apportionment available to them would be made available to them in terms of a grant. So it's a stepwise process. I would like to follow up with you about that, but as my time remains, I have one question that it's at a higher order, and this goes to Mr. Rogoff. There's been a debate within this committee about the relative merit of federal or taxpayers subsidizing, quote unquote, um, transit. And I wonder if you could tell us about the value of investing in 
transit, whether or not you make money off of it, um, to the, the traveling public and to the taxpayer? And do we get some of those same concerns that get raised for roads that are in the middle of nowhere, but we still have them uh, anyway and are happy to fund them? Well, I, I think our position uh, throughout has been that, that transit investments are absolutely essential, and frankly, they are, they are more essential now than they ever have been in the modern era. I think um, the uh, Deputy Administrator McMillan said in her opening statement, we've now crept back to a level of transit ridership not experienced since 1956, and it just seems to keep going up. What we are most focused on uh, at the Department of Transportation is the 2010 Census, and what it tells us, namely about 100 million more people uh, just by 2050. And even more acutely, those people are largely going to reside in areas that have already experienced sizable uh, population growth already. So the fast growing areas are gonna grow even faster. And if we're going to avoid a situation where uh, that growth doesn't choke off that area and choke off the economy in those areas, transit is going to be part of the solution. So is highways, so is ports, so are runways. I mean, with 100 million more people coming by 2050, we need more of all of it, but transit is certainly part of that solution. Mm -hmm. I live in the middle of nowhere, Donna. I want you to know that. <laughs> thank you for that, because I got to get home, you know. Um, Ms. Farrell, thank you for being here. It's good to see you. I want to say that in, in, in some ways, and I believe your intentions are good, you are hurting the people that I hear regularly uh, that you are uh, paid to, to help. The, um, as you're aware, on February 3rd, 2014, the Government Accountability Office issued a report that examined the CSA. This is about the uh, CSA and the safety measurement system. Um, among other things, the GAO found that FM CSA's minimum data required to receive the CSA SM SMS scores are not sufficient to produce reliable scores and do not allow for a cross-comparison of different carriers. GAO pointed out that this uh, led to FMCSA to identify at high-risk carriers who were not substantially involved in crashes, crashes. Ultimately, the GAO recommended that the FMCSA address limitations of the CSA program. Um, although the CSA program improves carrier attention to safety over its predecessor, we have heard from, I have heard from stakeholders throughout the transportation industry expressing serious concerns with the FMCSA's implementation of CSA programs. Inaccurate SMS scores have caused increases in insurance rates, expensive litigation, losses to business operation. For example, according to January 12th report of the American Transportation Research Institute, 50% of shippers admitted they did not enter into new contracts with carriers based on negative scores. And in largely, and you admitted this earlier, these scores are not necessarily accurate. In many cases, they're erroneous. Furthermore, you and I have had an ongoing discussion about, about hours of service. Your own report that was not done before the rule was enacted, and nobody's arguing that you had a legal right to enact the rule, uh, your report, um, uh, as we've discussed, the FMCSA's hour of service uh, rules, the field study, which came to Congress five months late, had only 100 carriers in and showed a mere tw 12 minutes increase, 12 minutes increase in average sleep time for drivers who now operate under the new rules. Uh, the American Transportation Research Institute, again, uh, questions your, your, your alleged that this is a savings, they believe that it costs almost $400, $374 million uh, a year. So that my point is that these rules and regulations that you, you talked about earlier about how you're addressing them, these are real day, every day, constant, ongoing, torturous problems that you're putting these truckers through. And, and frankly, the organization acts like they've got all the time in the world to correct these problems that are online. These drivers who try hard are suffering because they get a rating that apparently the GAO says could possibly be erroneous. And a lot of them, we know we are. The comparisons between large truckers and small truckers. Do, doesn't that cause you some concern that 
I mean, the very business that you're trying to help, the people whose lives, and I know you, you're, tr that you're, you're earnest, you're trying to save lives in this. Your own study that requires people to sleep at certain hours to tell them when they're retired, uh, when they're tired and when they're not, did not even begin to measure the fact that you push these drivers into early morning hours when the, they are much, much, much busier, uh, when the traffic is much more congested. What I'm saying is that you are really, I, I think you need to back up, ma'am, and take a look at some of this stuff and believe the drivers uh, that, that, who tell you, who write you, uh, and c c Congressman from Maine, uh, Mitch Odd, um, when I wrote you a letter about this, so I've kind of used up my, your, my time there for yours, but um, <laughs> I, I'm assuming, and I didn't not necessarily do that on purpose, but um, I think you get it, but it's, it, is, are we so thick that we can't hear the very people whose lives we're impacting? I mean, is there nobody be, you believe but some academic who does a study? And, and, and why, are you, why is it so rigidly adhered to when every day, and I know you do yourself, hear from people who do not like these rules, regulations, and you know you're hurting people, and the facts are, are, are I mean, they're not written by people who aren't doing it earnestly, but I'm sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Nuts. All right, thank you. Thank you, Congressman Hanna. Look, from the outset, real quickly, I'm not hired to help the industry. I'm hired to ensure the safety of the traveling public and improve the safety of the operations of trucks and buses. That's, that's what the agency was created to do. Um, and as its lead, I'm very proud to be a part of that. Initiative. I would say that you're not doing that because what I hear from the truckers is that you are pushing them into hours that are less safe that in many cases you're prescriptive about when they are tired and when they are not, and therefore they may be less safe. And when drivers uh, can't get a score that's accurate uh, and, and they're measured, their, their costs of doing business and who they're hired by are affected, and, and when you, you, you take hours of service rules that cause truckers to buy more trucks, work more, hire more drivers, put more trucks on the road, you are not necessarily doing what you say you're, you're trying to do. Yet I, I have no argument that you believe that. And so the second two pieces on CSA and hours of service, and I appreciate, I understand what you're saying, and we've had these conversations before, and I appreciate the time you've taken um, with me on those conversations, and I assure everybody this broken wrist is not from those conversations. We've always been very cordial and, uh, and, and I think very energetic. The hours of service rule at its heart is designed to reduce the kind of cumulative fatigue that comes from working up to 80 hours a week, week after week after week. And the effects of that fatigue impact the ability of drivers to drive safely. We certainly recognize there is a financial impact to that rule. There's a much larger and offsetting safety benefit to that rule and health benefit to the drivers. We do not agree on that. Yes, and I, neither I do understand. most drivers that I talk to. And 12 minutes a week does nothing to mitigate, to, to support what you just said. And that's your study, not anyone else's. And so on the Compliance Safety Accountability Program, you know, look, we've had several key studies recently. GSA says, GAO says you're not doing, you're, you're doing too much, use less data. Oh, are we, have, have I lost my time now completely? No, I did that to you. I apologize. Okay. But I've been, I thank you for, to uh, my friends for indulging me. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I, I want to thank the leaders and the leaders of this committee. I, th I think we did a really good job on water, and I hope we can do an excellent job on the surface transportation bill, and thank you all for being here. My question is a little bit parochial, but actually I think it will serve as an example for other uh, areas in the nation. Uh, Florida, I, I'm from South Florida. And uh, we have been uh, notified by uh, FEC uh, about a project called All Aboard, which will be a, a nonstop train that will make a few stops, one in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach, and Orlando. Um, and I happen to represent an, a, a, the area, uh, a large part of that area that the train will go through, and I'm getting mixed comments from my stakeholders depending upon where they're situated. The, the uh, cities where there's going to be a stop are embracing the project because they believe that there may be an opportunity for more economic growth. The cities that the train just passes through multiple times a day, of course, are 
concern, and let me tell you what some of their concerns are, and because um, my question is going to be whether or not there's a way to address them uh, with a federal response. For all board to do the project, they're going to they're applying for a, a RIF uh, loan of over a billion dollars. Here's what my uh, cities are asking: uh, they they're going to need funding for a traffic signalization for quiet zone infrastructure, for uh, there'll be uh, one city where uh, streets will be closed because of a new platform. They're asked, they need money for overpasses, for reliever roads. Uh, and then there are those uh, venues that want opportunities to take advantage of the uh, all aboard and they are looking for money for uh, other trans connecting transportation, both infrastructure and operating costs. And uh, f finally, the cities are all ask saying, well, uh, now we're obligated under law, under the uh, railroad law, I guess, uh, that they're going to have to pay more money to maintain the improvements. And so uh, my question is, I guess, what, what do you suggest as, as the best way to go about coordinating the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, for our community? Um, well, Ms. Frankel, uh, we are well aware of the uh, RIF loan application. Uh, we've been in discussions with um, the FEC uh, about it. Uh, it has been um, undergone a few changes. Um, I think the short answer to your question in terms of local impacts, those uh, issues are generally um, need to be solved locally uh, because uh, just as we have in other areas of Florida, whether it was um, in the SunRail project in the Orlando area, there was a lot of communications between the impacted um, municipalities, some of whom were making a financial contribution to get SunRail service. Uh, about these issues, about traffic interruption, about uh, related infrastructure. The RIF program itself can only pay for the railroad infrastructure, but this needs to be part of a, of a broader regional agreement. Uh, we are concerned specifically about one aspect about it, and that is to make sure that we don't end up subsidizing, if you will, two competing entities between Tri-Rail and, and the All Aboard Florida uh, vision. Um, and we're expecting that there will be an agreement between uh, the South Florida Regional Transit Authority and FEC before any RIF loan is made uh, to, to, to bring that about. Um, but I, I would strongly encourage you to, to have those uh, local community leaders engage the FEC in terms of, you know, the, the issue always comes down to who's going to pay for what. And um, I, I, that generally needs to be a regional discussion. Certainly formula funds that are brought to South Florida can be brought to bear on some of those needs. Um, but the RIF program can only pay for the railroad infrastructure by law. Does that, would that include the uh, infrastructure needed for quiet zones? Some of that related for quiet zones would be railroad infrastructure. Um, you know, in terms of the signalization, uh, in terms of the sort of added more robust um, railroad uh, safety measures to ensure uh, that we, uh, they would not have to uh, use the horn and therefore could uh, progress through the community. That generally requires greater gates, more precise signalization, and that would be RIF eligible. And, uh, okay, that, that, that's uh, very helpful. What about in coordinating other grant opportunities, such as a TIGER grant? Well, those, ex are those other expenses in the communities would be eligible for a TIGER grant, um, and we have just kicked off the new round, round six, which we're very excited about. Um, <laughs> the flip side of that, of course, is as we've had to say, uh, it's easier to get into Harvard than get a TIGER grant just based on the extraordinary competition for that money. So I don't want to you know, sort of lay out hopes and expectations, but it is certainly eligible for a TIGER grant. Okay. And this one uh, final question uh, on the trust fund. Uh, if the trust, if, if what you say c comes true and, and uh, there's no more money in the trust fund, are there going to be projects around this country that are going to be left incompleted? Absolutely. Uh, if, if we have you know, major projects in play and we have to eventually cease reimbursement, um, you know, we would start by slowing reimbursements. But I have to think that across the country, as not only state transportation secretaries 
entities like FDOT, but also the transit agencies themselves have assumed multi-year funding uh, when suddenly they know, know that they don't have the cash to float the federal government to wait for reimbursement for weeks, if not months, uh, then some projects are going to have to be halted. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate all of you being here. Uh, Secretary Rogoff, my question to you, I represent Texas. Of course, a lot of what we're talking about is really important to us. And uh, my question would be to you is this. The President... Uh, has requested $825 million to implement positive train control, the system, on commuter railroads with a phase-out scheduled in 2018. Uh, now, will you please explain to this subcommittee the significance of the 2018 spending timeline, and, as the administration, and is the administration planning on proposing an extension to the December 2015 PTC deadline currently in statute? Uh, do you think it would be it would make sense to extend the deadline beyond 2015 given uh, your budget uh, proposal? Well, Mr. Williams, we certainly recognize that the 2015 deadline is going to be extraordinarily hard to meet. Um, and quite honestly, we are having um, new and emergent complications with our partners at the FCC regarding the construction of towers that are necessary in some cases for PTC to be installed. Uh, that said, we are not inclined to move the deadline. We're just inclined to keep the momentum going. I think that the groundbreaking step as part of our budget is to say we recognize that this is not only uh, an urgent safety requirement required by law, it is also an expensive one. And we are helping put some federal resources behind it. Uh, but no, we're not inclined to necessarily move the deadline, but I think you could take the multi-year budget request as an acknowledgement that not everyone is going to make it. Okay, thank you. Uh, my next question would be to you, uh, Mr. Friedman. Uh, one of the rulemakings that uh, uh, you're working on uh, that raises my concern uh, regards requiring speed limiters on heavy-duty trucks. In states like mine, Texas, uh, we often have speed limits above 65 where trucks and cars, they drive safely on the highway at the same rate of speed. However, if you require the use of a speed limiter, you not only prevent the trucker uh, from moving with the flow of traffic, but in many states, you will require them to drive below the speed limit. Uh, this adds a speed differential to the highway, which leads to accidents. And do you, and you're analyzing this, uh, does this a uh, uh, concern and when you start thinking about this rulemaking? Thank you very much, Congressman. Um, as you know, we are in the middle of a rulemaking process on this issue. We were petitioned by the American Trucking Association as well as safety advocates to address serious concerns about roadway fatalities with large vehicles. Um, what we're doing as we go through this rulemaking is ensuring that we consider the data on to what degree does speeding increase fatalities. The higher the speed, the more the energy in a crash, the more dangerous the crash can be. What we're trying to do is diligently make sure that we're looking into the data, we're evaluating the costs and benefits, and we'll soon be able to talk to you about how we plan to move forward with rulemaking on this process. Well, I think it's important because, you know, traffic flows and what we're all after. I appreciate you taking a look at it. Thank you, sir. Safety is our bottom line with all of this. We want to make sure that everyone can get where they need to go in the time they need to go and that they're safe all along the way. People and product. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton. All right. uh, let me just say how much I regret not having been here to hear the questions given how uh, this committee is proceeded, uh, proceeding in good faith to try to get a uh, a, a, a bill out, so I would have benefited greatly. I had a markup, unfortunately, in another committee. Uh, this uh, region experienced uh, a horrific tragedy, uh, and out of that tragedy, I'm pleased to say, at least came the first uh, federal authority uh, to regulate uh, uh, metro or rail safety uh, through, through cities. It was the only uh, form of transportation that was not regulated. Now, I understand that these grants have been given to local jurisdictions to proceed, but I have a hard time understanding how they can do so adequately without the final rule on, on rail safety. So I suppose I should be asking Ms. McMillan about the final rule, and how does that how does that link to what the states are doing without the authority of the federal government in place? 
Thank you very, very much for that question, uh, Congresswoman Norton. And you know, indeed, as as um, as we've been saying, safety is absolutely critical, and advancing uh, where FTA is in that paradigm was a huge. Uh, uh, part of MAP 21 that we're taking very seriously and implementing. With respect to, again, the, the state safety oversight agencies that are uh, overseeing and partnering with us in, in carrying out uh, this law, one of the things that we realized is that a number of state safety oversight agencies are not yet positioned to meet all of the requirements that are in uh, MAP 21. Uh, which stipulated you know, wh what they need to be in terms of an organization and their capabilities for enforcement and issues like that, but as well laying out the steps that they would new need to do with us in terms of carrying out the regulations. On the former, it was important that we also recognize they need some resources to get to the place they need to be. So we've been working with each one on an individual, what we call sort of gap analysis of where they're falling short of what MAP 21 envisions them to be in terms of their capabilities to carry out regulations once they're done. And uh, we're, you know, ensuring that they have a plan of how to get there and this grant funding will enable them to, you know, assist them in getting to the place that, again, MAP 21 and the Federal Transit Agency would like them to be in terms of their own capabilities. Um, they will continue to be a partner with us as on a, another track. We are actually implementing the regulatory elements uh, for safety, including the common sense um, uh, you know, thresholds and requirements that need to be met. And when do you expect those to? We yeah, issued yeah. a advance notice of proposed rulemaking um, back in the fall um, because we, we knew that this was such a groundbreaking new uh, element we didn't want to jump into the deep end of the pool of rulemaking without getting substantial input from the industry, from the public, and uh, from other stakeholders. Uh, we got thousands of comments, uh, pages of comments um, on that advance no rulemaking. We're working through that right now, and we will then be proceeding to issue uh, actual formal uh, notices of proposed rulemaking. Um, once we've had a chance to go through But that. you don't have a date on that yet? We don't have a date yet, but we... Could I ask you one, one, one question about buses? You know, there, there's been complaints uh, from some parts of the country that uh, buses are, uh, and, and trucks are, have been stepchildren, ch for example. Uh, uh, Ms. McMillan, uh, for the state of good repair, I'd like to know, uh, it seems to be mostly for rail, uh, uh, and, and yet um, uh, buses and, and bus facilities have suffered tremendously. Is it mostly, what portion of the $86 billion is for buses? It's an excellent question. And the $86 billion is the estimate of the backlog uh, for um, deferred uh, investment, uh, reinvestment in infrastructure. A, Majority chunk of that is related to rail, but what's important to note is, is that even though buses may not make up the vast majority of that delta, the buses, then, because they aren't as capital intensive as rail systems, 40% of buses we believe are in marginal or poor condition. This leads to one of the major recommendations we have made in, as part of the President's budget. We have heard since MAP 21 went into effect that the bus and bus facilities level authorized for those two years is, is insufficient to meet the needs of the very uh, constituents you are talking about, which are bus uh, providers, very often in small and, uh, you know, smaller urbanized areas or rural areas. And we are seeking uh, over a 300% increase in the funding level to deal with that particular program. It went from a discretionary program to a formula program, and uh, there were so many parties in there that the funding level really does need to be raised. So we're hearing what the industry is telling us, as, as you've heard yourself, and we have a proposal on the table 
to uh, address that need specifically. Mr. Chairman, do I have time just to ask one question on for trucks? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, the, the, there's been serious concern about a rule that was withdrawn. It, 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 this has gone on for some years now. It has to do with the entry level training requirements. Uh, this, this I think I goes, I think goes to Ms. Farrow for uh, truck and bus drivers. Now we see an industry where, where that form of transportation, if anything, is increasing, and most of these are not your big companies. Um, that, of course, have their own driver training. In the absence of federal action for behind-the-wheel training, and, and that's what I'm mostly concerned about, uh, what you've had, and this is a vibrant private economy, you've got private, uh, private training schools. Some of them may be all right, but frankly, they've been much criticized as being diploma, but, but <laughs> diploma mills uh, who increase their own bottom line because they're offering a service. Uh, that uh, otherwise unavailable. I'm very concerned uh, that you apparently had a rule uh, and withdrew the rule. Um, I'd like to know, and since we required, we required this years ago, right. when you intend to issue a rule pursuant to the congressional mandate to do so. Was it 20 years ago that we said? Mm -hmm. how, how many years ago? Were, were they supposed to issue? Uh, 20, 20. Yeah, 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, I think y'all are a little late, in other words. Well, it's clearly a rule that uh, would have reached the age majority and had its license long before now. So uh, I appreciate your concern, and, and I think what's always so surprising um, to all of us is that a, a, um, an issue that seems so, share, so widely shared in interest and understanding that to operate a piece of equipment could, that could weigh up to 80,000 pounds, that could carry up to 70 to 80 people, that that driver does, is not required today to have training. And so I appreciate the concerns you raised, Ranking Member Norton. The FMCSA has tried for a number of years to move forward on a rulemaking, and we have, cha we have been challenged in finding uh, the research that demonstrates the cost-benefit analysis that we must provide with any rulemaking that shows that Training a CDL driver before they get behind the wheel actually results in long-term uh, savings and safety gains, uh, or savings through those safety gains. Consequently, after we had an NPRM on the street, uh, we did in fact pull it down uh, shortly after MAP 21 was enacted, moved forward with two research projects that will in fact help inform us. Um, on that very outcome, those safety outcomes that result from training, and have begun the process of convening um, a, at least st striving towards an approach of a negotiated rulemaking. There's so much agreement on the core of this issue, but the elements for which there is still not a clear uh, consensus is how many hours behind the wheel, how many classroom hours, should it be performance-based? Uh, should it be a set number? And so we are moving ahead. Um, we are very eager to because, again, for, of the, for the very concerns you raised. So, so I, I don't know how you're proceeding, whether it's mandated rules or, or what. I invite you to look at how we did uh, when, the, when there was disagreement in the, in the, as to how we ought to approach the regulation of rail when it hadn't been, Metro Rail had not been done before, and we give guidance to the states, and allow the states to do things. I mean, we've got to break out of, of this if, if the kind of mandated rules don't work. I certainly hope there's another way to get it done and that it would be within the mandate of Congress. And I thank you very much for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you folks for being here. Uh, Mr. Friedman, I'm going to start my questions with you in regards to the National Roadside Survey. I have not myself uh, uh, witnessed, but I have citizens that are concerned, and I'm going to ask these questions on their behalf. The option to drive past, is it, is it I'm driving past and I can just keep driving, or I have to pull in and then opt out? Thank you, Congressman Perry, for your question. Um, this is, as I mentioned before, a, a voluntary anonymous survey. And Just when, asking. When, absolutely. When, when, when the driver first approaches the scene, they see this large orange sign, and if they choose not to pull in, they can drive right on past. In fact, we believe that roughly about a quarter of the drivers, after they see the sign and are signaled to pull into the site, just simply drive right on. All right. Do you keep any records, or is there any tallying of the, when you say you believe this many people drive past? Is there any empirical data? regarding that or is it just a kind of a survey that you 
that you take randomly as you watch cars go by? I that's an important and very specific question, so that's something I'd like to get back to you on the record to make sure that I've got the information okay. you need. Are there police standing by that sign or parked by that sign or anywhere close to the entry of that sign where people might be encouraged because they see police officers there, flashing lights, et cetera? Well, uh, there are no flashing lights. What you have is a police officer who is standing near the entrance um, to the roadside survey site itself. The sign is further up, and that is the very first thing that the driver will see. And what are the police officer's actions? Is he flagging? Is he waving people in? Is he just standing there? What's he doing? Well, that is actually at the discretion of the police officers. The goal of having the police officers there is to ensure safety. And so we defer to them in their judgment. In some cases, the police officers choose to be the one directing traffic because they have the training and they are confident and want to be the one directing the traffic safely. In other cases, they don't, and our research team are the ones who are directing the traffic into the site. So I understand you're checking for the use of alcohol and drugs, and, uh, and if, if there is that present, that there aren't arrests made at the location. But doesn't that put law enforcement in a kind of untenable position if they find somebody in, under the influence of, of, of something that they, you know, I guess you're going to take the driver home or you're going to offer something, but isn't the driver also violating the law, which at that point the police are in some un untenable position because they're duty-bound to act? Well, what I can tell you, Congressman Perry, is that within the 40 years that this survey has been going on, not one survey participant has been arrested. Why? Because we have very strict protocols in place that work. I understand that. I'm talking about the police officers. What, is the, what, what position are they being placed in? So what are they having? Well, the, the police officers in, in these positions are there to ensure safety, and this protocol ensures that if we come upon an impaired driver, that they are safe. And so we are able to, to ensure that the police officer is able to meet um, their, to do their job and ensure safety. We make sure that I, I, I don't want to cut you short, but I've got some other questions. What I'd like you to do, if you could, is address the concerns of the citizens that I'm dealing with regarding the term volunteer and how it's, and, and how it's perceived if the default is to, I gotta, kind of got to opt out and strictly regarding law enforcement's presence there and what you might be doing as an agency to encourage people to go but, but not with law enforcement or to really truly make it volunteer. Uh, and, and regarding the safety enforcement, maybe some other alternatives like maybe the fire police or a private contractor that says safety on it as opposed to a uniformed police officer. Moving on, Ms. Farrell, I'd like to just talk to you a little bit about onboard recorders. In the rulemaking planning, that, uh, that you're considering. Uh, will there be uh, any requirement that the device have features which induce always-on data connectivity and real-time tracking that might induce that? Well, I'm hard-pressed to answer this, that to that level of specificity, um, Congressman, because we are in the midst of the rulemaking sure. process itself. But I can tell you that uh, we worked very closely before the rulemaking was launched with the technical experts, with stakeholders through listening sessions and the, our advisory committee. Uh, the, so the, but you would acknowledge that goes beyond the statutory requirement? I will say that we've um, stuck very close to the requirements of MAP 21 as to the properties of that electronic logging device. And we will have the rule out shortly, so folks will have a chance to answer that question more specifically. So because it would go beyond the statutory requirement, can we get any kind of feeling from you if it will specifically state that real-time tracking is not required in the rule itself, that verbiage, some type of verbiage to that effect? Well, again, I'm, I can't get to that level of specificity. I just want to drive home the point that this is a supplemental notice of proposed rulemaking. We'll have a 60-day comment okay. period, right. and really will look forward to those comments. I just want to get a couple other questions in here. It's my understanding that most electronic logging, I'm not a driver, but these devices record time minute by minute or second by second. So the question would be, what is a driver to do when they're close to? the location that they're supposed to stop, but they're not there yet. Traffic, something has happened. Are they supposed to pull over immediately, or what is, what is the give and take there? What, is the, what are the parameters for the drivers that are, will be operating with these devices? Well, today, companies have electronic logs on their, sure. on their vehicles of all, of all types, and, uh, and uh, their guidance to drivers is to adhere to the logging uh, time frames on that uh, on those devices. Okay, but that's that's drivers. their advice to their drivers. This is going to be a federal rule. It's a force of law. So okay. when I come up within minutes and seconds of my data logging device and it says I'm supposed to be off the road at this time, am I supposed to? Pull? I'm sitting in the middle of the Holland Tunnel, and and my 
clock is up. What do I do? Well, again, that's the, precisely the kind of question and comment that we expect to see during this comment period. And we'll have a great opportunity to have those sorts of discussions. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Polisano, apologize for we were trying to move it up and it just uh, That's okay. I only got here when nobody was here, so that's I've been waiting through the whole thing. Uh, and it's great to have the opportunity to pose some questions. And um, Undersecretary Rogoff and Administrator Nado, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, my area is the uh, home of the quarter of the national significance. Um, uh, rail truck quarters, 100 trains a day, 50,000 trucks uh, through my district. And it has a major effect on the roads, on the environment, on the congestion, the poor air quality and safety hazards. And we really appreciate the commitment of the 10 billion over the four years, but does your freight proposal focus on mitigation projects, especially air quality and great separations? And uh, how do you ensure those projects are giving a level playing field with uh, freight efficiency, uh, w um, playing field with the freight efficiency projects? In other words, so that they do uh, are able to uh, 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 work with those. And then I have another question, so I'd appreciate a quick answer. I'm going to give you a very quick answer, Congresswoman, and that is that I, I think we'll be able to spell this out when we actually transmit the bill in April um, and be able to describe it, but it really is, a, the, the notion is to have a combined decision making um, with freight stakeholders and state and local government, and state and local government will, will, will have a say in it. Plus there's a substantial discretionary component uh, to the freight program and the issue of mitigation uh, measures, especially those that deal with the particulate matter issues and, and clean air for the children in the community, I think is, is, is critical and would be part of our consideration. I'd appreciate some information when you do come to that because I have some areas that are very uh, low income that are suffering from uh, impact. And the second question is to uh, Administrator Nato is the comprehensive truck size and weight study. And I understand that uh, um, you are working on a comprehensive truck size and weight study required by MAP 21. Uh, and the concerns over the study process, the data which is being relied upon to draw conclusions uh, about safety and infrastructure impacts, there's been some criticism uh, of the um, contractor selected to, to do the study. And uh, you agreed to set up an external peer review to study six of those individuals on the committee have been found to have direct ties to the trucking industry or who had publicly advocated for higher size and weight limits. Um, how are we to ensure that this is going to be a study that is going to draw conclusions that are fair to everybody um, and uh, that is not predisposed on one side or the other and might not be skewed? And then uh, it would also uh, go to the uh, prediction that there's going to be a 63% increase in truck freight by 20 40, not being factored in, or that we're not considering the impact this has on bridges and uh, which are structure, structurally deficient. Uh, thank you, Mr. Politano. I'm, uh, uh, let me begin by saying that the department is working diligently uh, to produce the truck size and weight study as required by MAP 21. Uh, it is, and we are equally committed uh, to ensuring that it is conducted in a data-driven, objective, and transparent manner. Uh, I'll first touch on the uh, uh, national account uh, on the uh, peer review process. The National Ac Academies of Science and Transportation Research Board uh, were uh, contracted to provide that peer review. Uh, by contract and by uh, uh, history and tradition uh, in the conduct of such a peer review, uh, it is objective uh, 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 as well. Uh, they were responsible for selecting the team. A number of interest volunteered uh, uh, suggestions for that team. Uh, we're confident that that process, which has already actually been engaged. How can we be yeah. confident of that? Uh, I think, uh, I think uh, I'd like to say the results, uh, but that's not sufficient, I'm sure, with, with respect to your question. I think the, uh, uh, the Transportation Research Board and the National Academies of Science uh, and their reputation uh, and our commitment to ensure that their role in the process is objective uh, uh, is, uh, is something that I hope will provide you with some assurance 
uh, that, uh, that they will conduct their responsibilities uh, responsibly. Will we be able to ensure that, uh, is it going to be a report to this committee to be able to ensure that this is being followed in, in the transparency process? Well, I think, uh, uh, as you know, the statutory deadline for, for the report itself is uh, November of 14, but we are working extremely hard to produce at least elements of the study, and as we produce them in a very transparent way, uh, posted on the website, the work that the individual uh, work groups are, con uh, are doing in the uh, execution of the study itself uh, is being posted on a regular basis. So you'll see the work product from the various working group, and there are five study areas, as the work is produced, uh, extensive public outreach and public And, and I understand all of that, sir. Of that my, well. my concern is, like in California, they try to go to two, uh, uh, a tandem 53-footer which cannot navigate the on-ramps and off-ramps in, in our, our freeways. So for, for us to be able to be ensuring that this is going to be addressed, we want to uh, um, make sure that we are looking at what some of the outcomes are so that we can address them from our states, or at least from the Western Governor's state's viewpoint, if so needed. We're confident the expert teams that we've assembled can provide you with that objective data-driven analysis. And the answer to the uh, um, uh, bridges? You know, the truck freight is not being factored in, supposedly, according to the, our information. And then the secondly is that uh, so this, the, uh, bridge, the study will rely on a sample of bridges, but does not include those that are structurally deficient, already provided for by this committee. Uh, Would you take that into consideration and come back and let us know, please, I, because I, this I is was, a critical. I was going to suggest, so I'm absolutely clear on what your question is and what information you're talking about. I would suggest that we spend some time together. Would you please, sir? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your... Thank uh, you. Mr. Ribble. Well, good morning. We're getting near the end, folks. Hang in there. Uh, Administrator Farrow, I've got just a, uh, one comment, something to kind of put on your radar screen and then a question. Uh, my comment first relates to um, safe work practices for female drivers. I've had uh, some, some female drivers coming in, and more and more women are entering the trade of driving trucks. Uh, they're, they're concerned with the work rules requirement as it relates to finding safe harbor places to rest in the evenings. Um, that that uh, there are well-known places where they're very safe and others have worse reputations. Sometimes they feel like they're forced in a position of having to drive 35, 40, 50 miles further than what the work rules might to find a safe place with which to get rest. And um, they're concerned if, that, if they can't do that, then they're in a rest environment where they cannot rest because they're concerned about personal safety while they're supposed to be resting. <laughs> so I'm putting that on your radar screen for something to take a look at. Um, I want to just ask a quick question about traffic enforcement initiated uh, truck inspections. Um, last year, the agency found that this enforcement activity was highly effective for safety, yet the numbers are falling off dramatically. Uh, in 2010 through 2013, those uh, inspections dropped by 39 percent, and so far in uh, this year, 2014, they've dropped by 18 percent. Why would a highly effective safety method be reduced? I, Congressman, thank you. I, I agree and I assure you that uh, my agency leadership and employees across the country agree that at the end of the day, it's all about the driver. Um, and so traffic enforcement is an essential component of ensuring that we are getting to the safety outcomes we're driving towards in uh, commercial vehicle oversight. The uh, data that you're citing actually um, was raised uh, it, brought to our attention and reinforces to, at least to me and my team, that we've had states, we have a grant structure that has incentivized states to do more traffic enforcement through ticketing aggressive cars and trucks, or ticketing aggressive drivers or operating around large vehicles. And those, those data, that work is not counted as traffic enforcement within the normal grant program. And so where some of their work, their investigate, inspectors may have been diverted, to do some of that on-road enforcement work, we wouldn't see it in the numbers. And so we're re-examining both the level of enforcement work, but also, most importantly, how they're reporting it. Now, augmenting that, even more importantly, is we've worked extensively with the, Inter the uh, International Association of Chiefs of Police 
to augment their ability to carry out driver enforcement on commercial vehicles. Just straight speeding, unsafe lane changing, none of the complexity of uh, different levels of inspection. And IACP has been very energized uh, and, uh, and eager to press forward because that all of a sudden takes our 12,000 grant funded state officers to almost 800,000. Um, because again, I, boy, I couldn't agree with you more. The traffic enforcement is very important. Could you keep this committee up to speed then at, going forward on how that how how your decision making process is as, as it relates to that issue then? I certainly will. All right. Thank thank you very much. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Michaud. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing. I want to thank the panelists as well for being here uh, this morning. And my questions for Mr. Neto. Uh, as you are well aware, uh, for several years now, Maine has had an excellent uh, real-world experience with the use of heavier trucks, uh, six-axle trucks, that are permitted on both state and interstate highways under our 20-year uh, pilot program. The program is supported by the Maine Department of Transportation, uh, Maine State Troopers, Maine Truckers, Maine Shippers, as it has improved road safety and lowered uh, shipping costs while still protecting our infrastructure at the same time. In fact, uh, the Maine Department of Transportation Engineering analysis found that additional bridge costs uh, to accommodate the heavier trucks are theoretical and perhaps even zero. Uh, this is not theory or projections for some uh, interest groups uh, this is practical, on-the-ground experience that should be uh, very informative to the Department of Transportation truck size and weight uh, team. Uh, we hear a lot about the theory, and, uh, and, but what's really happened out there in the real world is different. Uh, my question is, uh, can you assure me that the Department of Transportation study is giving appropriate weight to the practical in real world experience uh, that we have seen in Maine, uh, not theory and what uh, some of the, those that might be for or against these are, are using theoretical examples, not practical experience. Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman Michaud. I think I can, uh, in that specifically what the study calls for is comparing impacts in jurisdictions where. Uh, 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 heavier weights and, and lengths uh, are allowed uh, to those where they are not. So uh, an empirical approach and analysis of this nature, I think, will yield that kind of real-world comparison based on real experience on the ground. So I think I can assure you of that, sir. I appreciate that, because I know our, a couple of years ago, actually th three or four years ago, when we first initially had the weight limit discussion for this committee, as you know, in the, the real world, before I became a member of Congress, that's what I used to do is actually uh, load tractor trailers and boxcars. So in some of the testimony we heard at that point in time was on, based on theory, not in the practical world. So I appreciate that. Uh, my second question, uh, also f for uh, Administrator Neto, is when I met uh, with your predecessor in this, uh, December, uh, you know, the Federal Highway pledged to review the standing general and uh, nationwide waivers to determine if uh, they were still war warranted on, under the Buy America revision. Can you tell me whether uh, Federal Highway has indeed conducted a review of these general waivers and what specific steps uh, Federal Highway intends to take in regard to these nationwide waivers that are currently in effect? Uh, be happy to. Thank you for the question, sir. Uh, we actually, uh, since that time, uh, we had initially uh, issued a memo to all of our division offices essentially clarifying the, uh, the application of, uh, of the national waiver requirements. Uh, subsequently, uh, put that out for, uh, to a notice of public comment and received an extensive amount of interest in, uh, in uh, uh, specific waivers and, of course, all the national waivers uh, that are included. Uh, as a result of uh, the interest and the complexity of some of those issues, uh, we've issued a notice of public rulemaking uh, on the national waiver uh, provisions of Buy America, 
which, by the way, is, uh, is a significant, uh, of significant interest to the administration in a, a broadly balanced applicability of Buy America provisions to ensure we leverage the, uh, the economic impact of the investments that the taxpayers make in their infrastructure. So that NPRM will provide, I think, uh, the opportunity for the entire highway community to evaluate the national waivers and their impact on the program. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to that exchange with the American public. And, uh, thank you, and I can appreciate your comment about uh, how important this is to the administration. However, I've seen in other cases where the administration talks, the president uh, talks about Buy America uh, as it relates to the Berry Amendment, which has been law since 1941, yet the Department of Defense is still not complying with a law that requires all soldiers be clothed from head to toe with American-made clothing. They're getting around that by giving a waiver for the athletic footwear. So uh, hopefully in this particular case, what the administration says is what the administration will do. i found in other cases that has not been the case, and we're still pushing them to uh, completely comply with the Berry Amendment as it relates to DOD, and I know that's not your issue. Uh, but hopefully we'll see a different tack uh, as it relates to this Buy America provision. So once again, uh, th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I see I ran out of time. Thank you, Mr. Neto. Mr. Mullen. Thank you. I, uh, I guess they saved the best for last. Is that correct, Chairman? No. no. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I didn't see him back there. Uh, well, I, I, I want to... Um, as Secretary Farrell, we, you know, we have spent actually quite a bit of time. Uh, you've actually came to my office uh, and visited with me, and I appreciate that. We've talked a couple times on the phone. Uh, but I, I still have huge concerns with the hours of service. Um, you know, we make a lot of rules here that have unintended consequences. And when we have a, a one-size-fit-all approach, um, it has unintended consequences. And the hours of service is having a lot of unintended consequences. So I just want to ask you, how many hours a week do you, do you work? Not at your office, but how many hours a week do you work from the time you get your first email, your first text, your first phone call in the morning until your last? Quite a few hours. Oh, I, I know. But, really uh, but the industry that you've set and that you're right. regulating, you're regulating their hours. Their industry is just as important That's as right. yours. That's right. And you're telling them how many hours they have to work, how many hours they have to rest. So how, how many hours do you, do you think you put in a week? Well, I'll clarify again. I work in an office, not behind the wheel. So my office is their office stationary. Is, their office is a truck, and my office, office used to be my truck, too. Yeah, that's right. Their office is on the roadway. So certainly I, I work probably on average 60 hours a week. Uh, does that include your Fridays and Saturday phone calls? Well, um, I would say or, on average. Or Saturday I, or Sunday. I would call? just say if we average it out, it's probably about 60 hours a week. I, I would probably say, just knowing you, you probably actually do a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. um, I know myself, I, I, uh, I would easily exceed that. Um, and I also know my sleeping habits. Mm -hmm. I also know that uh, I operate just fine off of five hours of sleep. I actually get a headache at six. I also know that when I'm traveling, there's things that happen. I mean, for instance, if, if you've got to travel uh, during the storms or the storms that we've had, especially this, uh, th this um, winter, and you get stuck at an airport and you don't get to the hotel until 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, like happened to us multiple times this year, mm -hmm. and your first meeting is scheduled for 8, do you push it back because you've got to have 8 hours in the bertha or, I'm sorry, in the hotel room? Well, again, I'm going to reinforce um, the agency that I operate, F FMCSA, mm -hmm. is established to oversee and ensure that crashes involving commercial motor vehicles I, are, I are get addressed. that, safety. And we take all the strategies. So, I get the, that. And the, and so you, so yeah. you look at safety, but what I'm sure. saying is you're, you're treating an industry like it's less important than the work that you have to get done. And when you have, when you have start times and says that you have 14 hours to get 10 to 11 hours driving done, period, and yet you're going through Atlanta and, and a storm happens and you've got to stop. Then we have unintended consequences because they run out of time and if they don't get someplace to get in the berther, or in the sleeper, the berther, mm. if they don't get someplace to get, to get into the sleeper, then 
they get fined, serious fined, and then that can affect their rating, and when in return that can affect their ability to carry for certain people, but yet it was beyond their control because they got stuck in the traffic jam, and they can't get their hours done, and so what we end up doing is having trucks pull off on the shoulders on off-ramps, and they sit there. And then they run out of time, and you know that's true, and there's no oh, safe zones yeah. for them to go to, so now the trucker, his safety is in concern because... He's nowhere in a protected area, and anybody can drive up. They know that that guy's there, and they know that they can rob his goods and rob him, too, and he can't move. He has to stop there. He's going to get fined, and his rating is going to go down. Unintended consequences. Uh, or or we're, we're in this situation that they've got to pull over because they're out of time, and the storm's right on their tailgate. It's right behind them. And, and they, if they can get through this period, this drive period, because they know they can push themselves they know, they know where they're at and when they're tired and when they're not. They're professionals. You're a professional. I'm a professional. We know ourselves. And the industry's done a great job at regulating themselves, but now it's not good enough. Instead, we've got to have somebody come in and tell them, you can only work 36 hours at a time. You, you cannot start your truck between 1 and 5 a.m. at least for two periods. 1 and 5 a.m. 1 and 5 a.m.? Sometimes that's the best times to drive, especially if we want to talk about safety because there's less cars on the road. But uh, we're regulating them. Yeah. And, ma'am, no one regulates how many hours you can work. That, Congressman, what you just described is, is absolutely why this is a very difficult industry to be a part of and why we have every reason to be very grateful for the commercial drivers who are professional, who are put safety first. And the hours are but we're doing a one-size-fits-all approach, and this is already having unintended consequences, right. and yet you don't want to hear anything about it. We try to challenge this. Yeah, I listen all the time. I, I like to hear a lot about but it. But what are we I doing about it? Sessions. Nothing. Instead, the rule went ahead and went into effect. And I think it's quite hypocritical mm. that you're working outside the parameters and the hours that you're telling the truckers that they can't work. Why don't you do this? Why don't you, why don't you do a study? You work the exact same hours for one month that you're regulating these drivers that say they can work. You go off the same exact time frame that they go off of. Don't answer your phone. Don't take an email. Don't take a phone call. They're in the same periods of time. You work only the hours that they're allow able to so work. And Congressman, speak, again, job. Congressman, we're talking about an industry whose office is behind the wheel on the highways with your family, every family member. And we're here. talking about me I and my drivers. I we're understand. talking about an industry that has done a phenomenal job. Yeah. And drivers a phenomenal been job since 1978. And under phenomenal this job rule. bringing it down before right. you or FMCSA I see. got involved. Well, the hours of service rule has been out there for decades. The but it, there was changes, flexibility absolutely. in it. The recent changes retained a driver's ability to run 70 hours a week. 70 hours a week. 60 hours a week without needing a restart. So, again, there are significant... And once again, how many hours do you work a week? There are significant operating opportunities within this rule. And really what you've described is why drivers should get paid more and be treated uh, as well as really I, the top companies. I do agree them. with that, but, yeah. ma'am, a one-size-fits-all doesn't approach, and yet you don't live by the same rules you're requiring this industry to, to, to live under. And every industry is vitally important. Every profession is right. just as important as the other profession. If there was a little bit of flexibility, mm -hmm. maybe some human factors that pl in play, maybe then we could talk, but a one-size-fit-all fit all approach does not fit an entire industry. Why don't we focus on those few that are breaking the law instead of punishing everybody? Well, and that's at the heart of CSA, so thank you for that closing point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Micah. Thank you. We did save the best for last, so... I just want to clarify that for the record. Um, let me go through some of this. First of all, when we worked on MAP 21, our intent was to try to consolidate or eliminate some programs. The report I have here from the staff says uh, we consolidated or eliminated 70 DOT programs. I'd asked earlier, I guess last year, how many positions had been eliminated or cut as a result of the consolidation um, or elimination. Mr. Rogoff, any idea? Uh, Mr. Baika, I don't think we reduced uh, net as a department. I don't believe we did reduce positions as a result of MAP 21. Um, so I think that's horrible, terrible, bad. Uh, staff, get the number of FTEs they had last year or this year. That wasn't the intent. The intent was to honestly consolidate, eliminate some positions. And 
um, then also devolve to the states where we can as many projects. Uh, while we're at that, now, are you going to oversee the Tiger, this Tiger round? Uh, the Tiger grant is run out of the Office of Policy, which is uh, under the uh, undersecretary's office, yes, sir. That's yours? Okay. Was it $700 million in this? Uh, 600 sir. 600 Yep. Okay. What's the date for those? Uh, we just put out the notice, and I believe the application date is either, uh, deadline is either April 24th or 28th. So we've had some bad uh, processing and not transparency. I hope that will be eliminated. So I want to uh, ask the committee staff also, let's monitor what, how's the, how that's being done. Uh, sure, we, we, we've well, had all, over Does all that money have to be out by October? Um, our goal is to get the grants out uh, in that time frame. Uh, okay. Does it have to be out? Not as a matter of law. Okay. It's not one. It does Try not expire not to one screw year. Screw my state this time too, like they did in the first round. I appreciate that. I know you got better as things went on. But I know personally you would love. We you would we, never we welcome all and every time. application from Florida. But I don't know else. of any just now. I just meant a general <laughs> gathering, but. Uh, let's see. So we want to check on the number of positions. Guys, be witness to this. Nothing gets eliminated or cut in, a, in any. Okay, project delivery and streamlining. That was also supposed to reduce some of the federal involvement. Can you, anybody there, any, anything in NEPA, do you know of any reduction in staffing? Anything? Well, I, I think most of the NEPA streamlining, sir, takes the form of um, uh, potentially less work on the part of project sponsors and consultants. But it also would be some on less It, it on could but over no time. Net, the, those provisions those are still being no put into place. No net efficiency then out of DOT. I, I think we're making a lot of our processes so, more okay. efficient. Here's what I like we, to We do. also got Let's new requirements get, under MAP 21 that record, people do. Um, don't mean to interrupt, but maybe for the record, just to substantiate what you're saying, is how many more you've processed. Can you tell us or the volume, maybe numbers, process, money amounts, something to substantiate that actually the streamlining is taking place? I, I, I think that would be a good one to take back for the record, Mr. Mike. Could you do that? It's, yeah, it's, that, a, it's that's, a data call, really. I just wanted to substantiate what's going on uh, and what our intent was. Um, okay. Got a couple more questions here. Tiffia. How much was the total request for TIFI uh, that we had coming in? I know we about five. We're months. doing. Uh, we're proposing a billion a year for four years, sir. That was what we increased. You, to. you, I think did seven fifty the first year. Okay, and a the first the year, and then it went up. Yes, sir. Because we had that little problem uh, of uh, a balance at the beginning, so we knocked it down the first year. Uh, but what was the total number of requests you had for the seven fifty or the billion, whatever we got? I, we've got. A great many requests. I, mean, was it, I don't was have a it, hard number, but it's it's well in the tens of billions of dollars, yeah. well in excess of anything. Provide that to us because, see, I heard that, the president and the administration talking about additional, and you leverage those dollars, it's a big deal. But I know there were a hell of a lot more requests than we funded. There are. And it's that it's light be years the cornerstone from to be. of any uh, new bill. Uh, huge number of requests, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So we need to look at that. That should be our goal, is to try to get that up there. And, and it's not just requests. There are larger that, projects, staff, too. If you can give me that, too, and work with you. I mean, that works. Um, and then we're going to do, if they get to rail, uh, we could do RIF, which should also provide a lot of uh, capacity for financing if you don't have the bucks. Okay. Let's see. Um, two things uh, I've got remaining. Um, Hours of service, I uh, heard that little discussion. Last hearing, I had talked about one of the truckers who came up, the uh, trucking officials said there is something that they use to see if troops or others are fatigued. We have that technology. He says all the stuff they're doing is crap. He says it's a waste of time. The records can be, all this stuff is, uh, can be done. But he said you can get uh, um, uh, this equipment the military has uh, put it on a driver and tell if they're fatigued. Have you looked in, anyone looked into that? We've been working through the Small Business Innovative Research uh -huh. Program. Have you seen that? Has anyone seen it? I've Could seen, you report back uh, to me personally? Yes, I will. Mr. Yes, I will. Because I was told that. I asked about it last year, and I think we're playing a bunch of games, but I'm telling you, those truckers just got me by the collar and said the technology is there, but we're in another era, and I'd like to see something on that. Okay. Then the final thing is deaths. Uh, who works in death, um, transportation? Rogoff, you got the 
or Mr. Nadu, do you have the numbers from last year? How many people were killed in uh, accidents? Um, maybe Freeman may probably has the, the uh, at least roadway fatalities. How many? In, Freeman. In, there were over 30,000 lives lost on our highways. Uh, no, but that's over. Now, we went, we were in the 40s, we came down to the 30s, mostly. It's about 33,000. 33, uh, so we're, uh, and then it went up a little bit. Are we back? Did we have a reduction over the previous year, or did we have an increase? So uh, we've, we've gotten to historic lows, and then in 2012, we saw an increase. The early data from 2013 is showing that we've gone back down. Back down. 2012, right. but we've got to wait for that data to be finalized to be sure. But we have seen a decrease according to the early data. And have we done anything uh, more on um, one of the things is just like the uh, separating the traffic with the barriers in between on the interstate. I had asked the question, too, how many miles we have of that separation. Um, anybody know, Nadu? Just uh, uh, your first Pardon? cable median barriers? And, yeah, any kind of barrier. The cheapest thing to keep them going across, killing people. That would be cable median barriers in, in many, many states across the country. Can you it's give me the number of miles? I can't, but be happy to get back to you with Give uh, me the number of miles we've done and what we've got to do. Okay, I think yes, that's sir. worthwhile. Of course, the distracted driver is still a huge uh, problem. Well, that's all for now, but I will. Uh, how long are you going to leave the uh, thing open, Mr. Uh, Chairman? Uh, Fifteen days. Okay. I might have a couple I want to submit. Look forward to Farrow uh, getting me back on that. Some of the other information I requested. Don't forget Florida, F-L-O-R-I-D-A, Mr. Rogoff. $600 million will take even a small share. Still high unemployment. Thank you. Bye. Good to see you again, Mr. Chairman. Ask unanimous consent the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to them in writing. And unanimous consent the record remain open for 15 days for additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing. Without objection, so order. And uh, this hearing stands adjourned.